All right, thank you, uh, Angela and Neil. Um, that was very, uh, very enlivening discussion. So uh, lots more to come on AI and peer review in the future, I'm sure. Um, for our final session today, uh, science and social science communication as storytelling will be moderated by Stuart Wills of the Optical Society. So as the panelists uh, come up and get set here, please feel free to refresh or drink, grab a snack. Okay, so I think we're going to get started uh, so we can stay on reasonably close to being on time. Uh, af after a very uh, stimulating uh, morning debate, uh, my name is Stuart Wills. I'm the editor of Optics and Photonics News, the news magazine published by the Optical Society, and I wanted to welcome you to this final session of the 2018 New Directions Seminar on Science, Communication, and Storytelling. So last week I was at a photonics conference uh, here in D.C., and I overheard a fragment of animated conversation uh, by two scientists, both of whom were rather senior people in their field. And one was saying she had been talking with someone in her university's psychology department who had been exhorting her rather vehemently to find ways to talk about her research as a story, that e people only grasped and retained things if they got them as a story. And the other scientist said, yes, yes, everything needs to be a story. I learned that the hard way. It sounded like there might be a pretty good story there to come about how she learned it the hard way, but alas, at that point, the two of them went out of earshot, and it will remain forever unknown to me. But these days, you don't need to go too far to hear someone talk about the importance of storytelling and narrative in communications that stick, uh, and about the hardwired human appetite for stories, uh, evident in everything from NPR's StoryCorps project to uh, storytelling venues like The Moth, to the current sort of insatiable desire for personal memoirs to the fragment of conversation I overheard between two scientists. And appreciations for storytelling's value uh, might even be called trendy. But how do you tell a good story about something that to many people uh, seems as forbidding as science? How do you shape stories for different audiences? How do you best you know, how can we best press into service the sort of unusually rich mixed media set of options for storytelling that we now have at our disposal? And, you know, what's the need or responsibility and the best way for people like those in this audience in traditional scholarly communications to leverage storytelling and narrative techniques in, those, in their work? And these are the questions we'd like to explore in the next hour. Fortunately, we have a fantastic set of guides for this, uh, representing a number of different perspectives, from that of the professional scientist to the scientific publisher to the public information officer to the journalist. We're going to have each of them talk for a few minutes about the challenges and opportunities they've found uh, in telling stories about science to various audiences. And we'll start with Connell Alexander, a staff scientist uh, specializing in cosmochemistry uh, at the Carnegie Institution for Science, who will give us a bit of his own experience uh, from the perspective of a working researcher. And I'd like to thank Connell uh, for stepping up at the last minute to replace Stephen Shirey, who was unable to make it today although Connell probably did not know he would have to go first. <laughs> OK, well, um, I have never in my education and in my professional career never been taught how to give a public lecture. In fact, uh, I think it's a sort of unstated attitude within the science community that uh, it's not something that can be taught. You either have it or you don't. And if you don't, leave it to the professionals. <laughs> so. Um, I would say that Steve Shirey definitely has it. Um, he has the added advantage of working on diamonds, which I think everybody can relate to. Um, I don't really have it, and I don't do it very often. Um, but uh, I do work, on, I'm a geologist, I work on meteorites, space rocks, and I, on what they can tell us about the origins of the solar system. So that surely should be a relatively easy sell to most people. Well, mm, not always. And I learned that very early on in my, uh, the hard way when I was asked to give a uh, presentation to my daughter's pre-K class. <laughs> and I was sure that they would be absolutely thrilled and excited to be able to touch ancient space rocks. Uh, they weren't. Uh, the minerals and uh, fossil shells and things they brought were not much better, were not much more exciting to them. They, they were starting to get fidgety. And it was only right at the end when I brought out the fossilized shark poop that the whole room explo exploded. Uh, hallelujah, I had a success. 
But uh, rule number one is know your audience. <laughs> it's not always easy. Uh, another piece of advice that I was given uh, is that uh, start off with something that will engage the audience and then try and bring as many people as you can along with the, some sort of story or, or theme uh, as you get more and more technical. Now, uh, first of all, I know very little about your backgrounds, so I've already uh, broken the first rule. Uh, and secondly, it's very hard to bring people along in a 10-minute talk um, in a gentle, easygoing way. Nevertheless, um, I have decided to try and give a much abridged version of a talk that I uh, gave a few years ago on why metrite research is important and what it can tell us about how you make a habitable earth with human beings on it, or how, how this earth with a habitable human beings on it came to be. So, I guess. Now, as you can see, uh, before I sent in my slides, I forgot to decide on a title. I was also thinking of riffing on a, a Monty Python uh, skit, uh, What Did the Romans Do for Us? But uh, <laughs> I'm digressing. So. Okay. So uh, human beings have always been fascinated with the sky and what falls from it, be it rain or shooting stars or whatever. Uh, and also, some meteorites are made of iron, and that has a more practical use, at least in societies that have, hadn't discover, haven't discovered how to make iron for themselves. For instance, Tutankhamun had this beautiful dagger made from a meteorite uh, buried with him. Uh, the Inuit in Greenland used uh, iron meteorites to make uh, spear tips and actually traded them with uh, Inuit in North America. Uh, the uh, Native Americans in Arizona and places like that, as well as in the Midwest, used them for making jewelry and also traded in them. Uh, so they have a, both a, a mystical and a practical use to them. Uh, they also used for, as omens by politicians. For instance, the first recorded uh, uh, fall of a meteorite uh, in Europe uh, in 1492, just a couple of months after Columbus discovered and, uh, North, uh, the Americas, um, was uh, in Ensisheim, which is now in the Alsace region of France. At the time, the uh, heir to the uh, Holy Roman Empire was... Uh, in the region making war on France and getting ready for a battle, he declared that this was a good omen and promptly won the battle. So uh, uh, the, the, uh, the meteorite was ordered to be uh, stored in a local church, preserved in a local church, and they proceeded to uh, uh, chain it to a wall just in case it decided to try and uh, go back whence it came from. Despite the, the clear evidence that uh, uh, meteorites had an important role to play in uh, human affairs. It took another 300 years for scientists to realize that, or accept that they really came from uh, outside of the Earth uh, and therefore were worthy of scientific study. Uh, we now know that meteorites come in many different flavors, uh, but they can sort of be basically uh, um, divided into two. The ones, uh, and I should say that the, the the meteorites, except for a few that come from Mars and the Moon, all come from asteroids which orbit around the Sun between Mars and, uh, Jupiter, Mars and Jupiter, and they're the sort of last vestiges of the, of the building blocks of the inner solar system planets, the Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. They fall into two flavors, uh, uh, the, the meteorites, uh, and they basically reflect when their parent asteroids formed. So the ones that formed early in the first two million years or so of solar system history, there was a lot of radioactive material around produced by supernova, uh, generating heat. So these objects melted, differentiated into an iron core, the iron meteorites that people, uh, many people would like to use, and, and then a silicate mantle, which looked very much like volcanic rocks. If they formed a bit later, and I should say this is a problem, these uh, melted asteroids seem to be in the major building blocks of the Earth, but they don't have any of the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen that we need to make a habitable planet. So uh, that's, if things didn't melt and get so hot and melt, uh, they formed a little uh, from asteroids, they come from asteroids that formed a little later, they do have the carbon and hydrogen. And there's been a major debate about where the carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen and everything that we need to make a, a habitable planet, whether they come from these types of meteorites or perhaps from comets. And we'll come back to that uh, later. Now, of course, meteorites don't come in just nice 
nice little sort of kilogram-sized objects that we like to study. Some of them come in uh, as much larger objects. For instance, a 100-kilometer object, uh, a 100-meter object generated meteor crater in Arizona. In fact, this is the source of much of the iron used by the Native Americans in, in the southwest and uh, uh, midwest. If we go back, and this happened about 50,000 years ago, we know we're in the next few thousand, 10,000 years, we're due for another one this sort of size, which is why NASA is actually looking for all uh, objects of sort of 100 meters and larger in the uh, near Earth orbits. If you go back a little bit more, uh, an object about 32 million, 35 million years ago uh, created a 50, 50, kilom 50 mile across crater, roughly, that ultimately caused uh, or generated the Chesapeake Bay. So if you like sailing and crabs, thank the, go the meteorite gods. <laughs> and if we go uh, a little bit further back, of course, we come to the uh, even bigger crater that uh, was responsible for the death of the dinosaurs and the rise of mammals, uh, and, and ultimately us. And it's sort of, if, if this had happened a little, a little different place or a little different time, it may not have been nearly as devastating. We may not be here, which sort of goes to uh, illustrate how random uh, it was that we came to be at all. Now, if we go back even further and look at the surface of the moon, we get an idea of what the Earth might have looked like if we didn't have weathering and plate tectonics that erased some of these early craters uh, that were even bigger, thousands of kilometers across, potentially. In fact, the moon is perhaps the uh, product of the, of the granddaddy of all impacts that affected the Earth because it's thought to have been formed by a giant impact between the proto-Earth and a Mars-sized object. And I have, I hope, a movie that, uh, to illustrate how this might have happened. Let's see if it'll... Yeah. So here we have uh, the, the Earth. It's differentiated into a core, and the green is the rocky mantle. Uh, coming in at about uh, 15 kilometers a second is a, a Mars-sized object, also with its own core, and uh, uh, silicate mantle. And watch what happens, particularly uh, what happens to the, the core of the Mercury-sized object, a uh, Mars-sized object. No, is it not going to work? Come on. So in the process of this impact, you are vaporizing a lot of the rock. Uh, and you can see that uh, the core of much of the object uh, gets smeared out and starts to rain down through the Earth's rocky mantle. And the moon eventually is going to form from this small amount of debris that is uh, left in orbit around the Earth, which is also made up of vapor and rock, uh, and liquid rock. Now, until recently, it was assumed there's no way that volatiles like carbon and water would survive such an a, a incredibly violent impact. So all the volatiles that we need to make a habitable Earth must have come to after the moon-forming impact. But uh, that's not the case. And there are two, so, two, so, two uh, lines of evidence. First of all, my uh, uh, colleague Eric Howry demonstrated that contrary to 40 years of research, the moon is not dry. In fact, it probably has as much water as the interior of the Earth does. And secondly, it was uh, realized that if all of this raining out of material, uh, of metal in particular, through the Earth, which should have uh, essentially leached out all the metal-loving elements, particularly the, the, the precious metals like gold, iridium, um, platinum, and things like this, we know, obviously, that there is, in fact, some of these elements still in the Earth, because we mine them. And uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that the, uh, and, and the reason we have this material is, as you can see here, I don't know if the laser pointer is working, but as you can see here, they have very low abundance of these very commercially important elements. Uh, but they're nevertheless, they're there, much higher abundance than we predict. And that's because after the moon forming impact, material kept falling in onto the Earth, these meteorites bringing in um, more of these precious elements. And we can look at the abundance of these elements and estimate how much of that material it was and what type of meteorites it was that was bringing in these elements. And they were, seem to have been uh, a relatively low amount of this material, uh, the meteorite material, 
and they were not the types of meteorites that would have had lots of water in them, or, or carbon or hydrogen. In fact, one minute? Yeah. Okay. Well, okay, we'll finish on this one. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, it looks like the water uh, and carbon and oxygen was delivered before the moon forming impact in meteorites, in a very particular type of meteorite um, that we think came actually uh, from asteroids that ultimately formed in the outer solar system and were scattered into the inner solar system uh, by Jupiter as it was forming and perhaps wandering around a little bit, uh, which is a whole other story of wandering giant planets, which is uh, quite fascinating. And the evidence we have for this is uh, uh, based on isotopes. I don't have time to go into what isotopes are. All I want you, whoops. All I want you to, to see is that the Earth's composition would be at this crosshairs here. Uh, and all the extraterrestrial samples we have available would plot in this region uh, here, if, uh, or, or, or plot away from this region here, except for these two different types of so-called carbonaceous chondrite. Comets don't do it. The solar, solar gas, and uh, the bulk solar uh, composition doesn't do it. Uh, it's only these types of meteorites that actually dominate in the outer part of the asteroid, and probably we will have good evidence for came from the outer solar system was scattered into the solar system. In fact, one of the interesting things is that the fact that this material does not look like the solar composition suggests that some fraction of the material that we're made of uh, actually is un came to the Earth as unprocessed interstellar material, um, something like 10% or maybe less. And I'll close on that. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Connell. I appreciate uh, your, uh, your coming to talk to us. And that was an interesting talk for our, uh, for our purpose today because it, I, I found as you were going on that it actually put together a lot of interesting elements on how you kind of try to make a, uh, a complicated story accessible through storytelling techniques. Our next speaker is um, Yael Fitzpatrick, who's also a co-organizer co of this session. She runs a Gazelle Design Consultancy, which focuses on art direction and design for scholarly communication, and has previously worked in journal art direction. So she'll talk a bit, both from the perspective of a journal publisher and of the needs and opportunities for visual storytelling. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, good morning. I would like for you to think visually in ways that perhaps you haven't before. I would like for you to think about design, and specifically design for scholarly content in ways that you perhaps haven't before. So the big question is, is why? You know, why, why does design matter? Why think about it at all? Well, quite simply, design, design matters. One of the most striking and infamous examples of why design matters is a very poorly designed butterfly ballot that was used in Florida in the year 2000 that arguably altered the result of the United States presidential election. So design does matter, and when executed well, it communicates effectively. It engages an audience. So why look at design from a storytelling perspective? Well, storytelling engages as well. Storytelling pulls in an audience, helps to have research feel relatable, helps them to feel like they're somehow invested in it. it. It humanizes. And at the end of the day, the human element is what it's all about. Humans are the ones doing research for, one way or the other, the betterment of other humans. It's where it begins and it's where it ends. So when you're thinking about communicating visually, think about making that human connection. If you're showing images, think about is there a way to have images of people in there to pull at some emotional heartstrings, to, to create a further emotional connection, to show people impacted by the research that you're talking about. And now I'm not suggesting that if you show people at all that it always be maudlin or it be depressing or it be emotionally manipulative. It can be, it can be fun, it can be whimsical. Um, and actually a, kind of a, a fun ancillary story to, to this um, and an additional level of connection about a week after this particular issue was published, the little boy in the center of the photo, who has since all grown up, contacted me. And it turned out that he had grown up to be a social science researcher. 
So again, why storytelling? Well, it, it can make research much more approachable. Let's think about metaphor. Now, when we think about metaphor in, in written or in spoken storytelling, it can be very powerful and very memorable, very evocative, metaphor or simile. When I was a kid, my dad bought me a subscription to Omni Magazine, if anybody remembers Omni Magazine, as a birthday present one year. And there was an article about black holes in one of the issues. And there was a description in this article that said that if you were to find yourself next to a black hole, the gravitational pull of the black hole on you would feel as if you were hanging off of the Golden Gate Bridge with half of the population of Canada hanging off of your ankles. It was, it was a heck of an image. And the fact that I still remember it literally decades later, I think proves the point. Another example, more recent, was something that I heard from a public information officer at NASA during a briefing about the Mars Curiosity landing. He was talking about the landing site itself. He explained that there was a relatively large ellipse that was the, the target landing area. And within that ellipse, there was one particular spot that was the, the goal, the target landing spot. And when he was asked how close the actual landing was to that targeted spot, he described it as somebody in Tokyo hitting a golf ball, aiming for one specific window on the Empire State Building, and hitting the next window over. Such a powerful mental image and something that could make anybody relate and understand the science behind what he was discussing. So when you're thinking about visually communicating scholarly information, think are there ways of translating metaphors into visual metaphors? I worked with a group of physicists in Germany to visually explain a concept called the Lamb Shift. It's a concept in particle physics. I could not for the life of me explain it to you scientifically if you put a gun to my head, but I can tell you that it can be visually explained with the idea of a single object reflected infinitely between two almost parallel mirrors. And that's something that it's a clear and concise visual that everybody can relate to and that can help people pull into the science and understand it even a little bit. When you're thinking about how to communicate research visually, embrace simplicity. Humor is good too, and, and sometimes they can overlap. One of the greatest examples of this is the brilliant Upgoer 5 created by the brilliant Randall Monroe of XKCD. I suspect a lot of the people in this room are familiar with this. If you are, look at it again. If you're not, check it out for the first time. Randall took the schematics of the Saturn V rocket and using only the 1,000 most commonly used words in, in the English language, he created a schematic of that rocket. Although technically it was the, the 10 hundred most commonly used words because thousand is not one of the thousand most commonly used words. <laughs> he took a lot of really complex information and he simplified it visually and verbally and injected a heck of a lot of humor into it as well. So humor is excellent, it's an excellent tool, but in all seriousness, it's, it's, it's not always necessary, but simplicity is always powerful. We all know the concept of needing to eliminate jargon in communicating scholarly research. That is absolutely true for visually communicating research as well. Artipithecus ramidus was one of the most significant paleontological results of our lifetime. There was a fossilized skeleton that was known of to the community for 14 years before the research was published. The scientists wanted to make sure that they took their time, that they did the research thoroughly and well before they published the results. 14 years is a long time, and there was a lot of anticipation and a lot of hype that built up. So when it came time to finally publish the results, some people had the instinct to throw 14 years worth of visuals at it to kind of depict that. But at the end of the day, it was about this one fossil. And as the initial introduction to the world of this fossil, the best thing to do was to keep it simple and to pare it down and just show the fossil skeleton itself. And that was the more powerful solution. And a lot of people think that collage is great. More is better. 
Resist the urge, please, I beg you, if you take one thing away from this talk, resist the urge to collage. Powerful images are usually singular images. When you're thinking about visually communicating, consider the tone. Consider the tone both of what you're communicating and how you want it to be perceived. Is it something grave and serious? Is it maybe something a little more, more whimsical? Oftentimes, visually communicating research restrains people to a single image, but consider even if within that image, if there are ways of creating a story arc, creating a, an entire story within one piece. Infographics are a great example of that as well. But even if you are restrained to a single image, have that image count, have it be worth those thousand words that the cliche calls for. And realize that even if you think you're, you're limited, that limitations aren't necessarily just that. This is an example of a book that was one color, one column, six by nine. Seems like it should be pretty standard. But the subject matter was about religious sects in, in Russia and the Ukraine during the late 19th and early 20th century. And the most defining characteristic of these religious sects was that they had an extremely strong connection to the, to the land. And so by taking an otherwise fairly standard, quote unquote, limited page layout, we were able to create top, wider margins top and bottom, narrower margins side to side, have running feet instead of running heads, have the folios anchored to the bottom, and thus create a sense of landscape across the design, tying back into the subject matter of the book. Consider scale when you're communicating visually. This infographic brilliantly shows um, examples of different telescopes around the world using just that point. Consider color. And I, it, the irony is not lost on me that a woman dressed all in black and showing a black and white slide is saying to consider color, but do consider color. It can, it can set a tone, it can set a mood. It can help to introduce very complex, intimidating information in a much more approachable and friendly way. But I ask you that when you consider color, especially if you're using it as a critical component to, to explaining data, that you consider people who cannot consider color. One in 12 men are colorblind. One in 200 women are colorblind. There are no excuses these days not to employ colorblindness simulation tools. They're free and widely available everywhere. It's going to give you a better result. So again, we come back to our, our key question of, of why. Why do I want you to think visually when you're communicating research? And I think it's because at the end of the day, we all have the same goal. We all want to communicate research to as broad of an audience as possible in as effective a way as possible. And if I can give you some visual tools to consider to do that, then I hope that this was time well spent. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Yael. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Lauren LaPuma, a senior public informa information specialist and writer at the American Geophysical Union. Uh, and Lauren will talk a bit about uh, storytelling and various techniques for it uh, from the PIO's perspective of communication uh, to um, the press and the public. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I work at the American Geophysical Union. I'm a press officer there, and I see some AGU staff in the room, so that's great. Um, we're a society representing about 60,000 Earth scientists worldwide, Earth and space scientists worldwide. My job is to comb through the many journal articles that we publish every year. We have 20 journals, and, and also the abstracts that are presented at our meetings, and find stuff that is newsworthy, which means it would be, interest, be of interest to people outside of the scientific community, and then translate that into something accessible and interesting and promote it. So I write a lot of press releases. I do a lot of uh, I write blog posts. I also do multimedia content. I help design infographics. I um, produce video projects. And actually, this past year, we also started a podcast at AGU about kind of the experience of being a scientist and the methods behind it. So I also uh, help produce that as well. So I do science communication and storytelling it through a variety of media. So what I wanted to kind of talk to you today about was um, what kind of storytelling means to me from my perspective, give you some tips for storytelling that I've kind of picked up along the way, and show you some examples of how to find a story within science, and um, also then go into some common challenges I've seen or challenges that researchers have approached me with when they're trying to tell their story. 
and then show you a, an example of how at AGU we've done storytelling um, through multiple media, and then just give you some quick uh, examples of opportunities for storytelling here in DC. So storytelling really is just putting information into a context that's relevant and interesting. Um, just like Yael said, there's a human element. The, go ahead. Put this in the slide oh, it's not. Yeah. Thank you. Like I, Yael said, you know, there's the human element is really important in storytelling. The point of it is really to create a connection with the audience. It's to present information in a format that people will remember and connect with. And at its core, a story is really just a buildup and release of tension. Um, kind of like you have that rising action, obstacle, 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 then your climax, the aha moment, and then the falling action. So really it's just that buildup and release of tension that drives the story. So some tips for science storytelling that um, we tell our researchers pretty often is, just like Al said, avoid jargon, make it clear. Um, jargon has no place outside of scientific publications. When you use jargon to a non-science audience, you know, when you're telling a story, you're talking about a piece of scientific research, if someone doesn't understand the word that you're using, they're gonna be stuck on it and they're gonna be thinking in their head, what does this word mean? Is this word similar to other words I know? Can I figure it out from context? And then all of a sudden, they're not listening to you anymore. They've forgotten the thread of what you're saying. So use clear, accessible language. Make it relevant, which means show people why they should care. No piece of research or no line of investigation will get funded if you can't prove that your research matters in some way, that it's going to benefit humanity in some way, even if it's a small way. So take that piece and make sure that your listener or your reader or your audience understands it, why they should care. Make it interesting. Like Gail said, you know, use metaphors, add in anecdotes, add in details. I know in scholarly publishing, scientists are taught to remove everything about themselves, all creativity from their publication. The science is really what needs to take front stage. But when you're telling a story or when you're communicating with a non-science audience, I say do the opposite. Um, add in back the personal stories, the anecdotes, humanize the science, because as Yael said, science is a process. Research papers don't just fall from the sky, they're made by people. Um, one important thing too is you know scientists often talk only about their successes, I really recommend also talking about your failures. I would say, I mean, I'm sure that there are far more dead ends in science than there are actual success stories, or for every dead end, for every, you know, 10 dead ends, then, then finally the breakthrough happens. And those things are important to communicate outside of science because it shows that it's a process that is done by real people, and it also creates that sense of tension and helps people connect with it and show that scientists also face these challenges and these obstacles in their, in their work and their lives. Um, and then make a connection, so add in some emotion to it. And I don't mean be emotionally manipulative and be overly dramatic, but I mean add in just a little bit of that human element. Um, it doesn't always have to be, like, it does not always have to be negative. It can be very positive or it could just be something um, different. Recently, I interviewed a scientist who studies submarine volcanoes, and he was describing to me the experience of going down to the ocean floor and doing exploration in the human-occupied submersible Alvin. And he said, he, he described to me the excitement that he felt knowing that he was seeing a place on planet Earth that no human had ever been to before and how that was so thrilling to him and so humbling. So anything like that. Um, I also recently interviewed a researcher who um, is working on this, who had dis helped discover this new celestial phenomenon that's kind of similar to the Northern Lights, but it's actually distinct. And she talked about how exciting it was to, you know, have a new discovery and just study something that's absolutely new and has not been described before. So anything like that that will add a little bit of an emotional connection will help your audience connect with you and remember the story. So the good thing is, for science, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Literature has been around for a really long time, and there are a lot of narrative themes that are very common in literature, and science actually lends itself to a lot of these themes. So see how your science, I'm going to show you some examples of how science can fit into some of these narrative themes that are cl very classic, almost ubiquit ubiquitous throughout literature. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, it's just a couple examples. First one, pretty obvious, the discovery. Um, a good example of this is Jane Goodall's book, In the Shadow of Man, where she talks about her research with primates. Um, pretty self-explanatory, a new discovery is always something people can identify with and connect with. The mystery, also again, 
pretty self-explanatory. I make the argument that pretty much all scientific investigation is a mystery story. There's something we observe that's happening, we don't know why it's happening, and we need to figure out why. That right there creates a, a narrative tension and makes the, leader, or the reader engage and want to know more, what happens next. A couple of my favorites, ooh, excuse me, are um, first is a stranger comes to town. This is that whole idea of, you know, kind of the classic Western where the stranger walks into a bar and no, nothing is ever the same again. <laughs> uh, natural disasters are actually, as, you know, as terrible as they are, are really good examples of this. You know, an earthquake comes, an earthquake happens, a hurricane rolls in, there's a tornado, and everything is different. Everything has changed. Um, a really good, I, I think one of the best examples of this is Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring. So she talks about the dangers and the damages of the reckless use of the pesticide DDT that was going on in the US in the early part of the 20th century. I'm going to read you a little snippet from it here. So Rachel Carson doesn't start off the book by saying, DDT is really bad. Here's 20 reasons why. What she does is starts off with a fable for tomorrow. So the very first chapter of the book starts like this. There was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of green and hillsides of orchards where, in spring, white clouds of bloom drifted above the green fields. She goes on a little further and she, then she says, but then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere there was a shadow of death. She goes on a little further and then further down she says, no witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in this stricken world. The people had done it themselves. So right there she's creating this tension and you see this strange blight coming in which is the stranger coming to town. And she spends the entire rest of the book explaining what that is and how and the effects that it had. This is really powerful. This is probably one of the reasons why this book became such a classic and you know pretty much spawned the environmental movement in the 60s. Another really classic story is the idea of coming of age or going through a rite of passage. So this could be a story about an individual researcher and their own journey, their own path. It could also be the story of the coming of age of an entire field of study. And an example of this is the Poisoner's Handbook by Deborah Bloom, which if anyone has not read it, I highly recommend. Um, the story, this is the story of the birth of forensic science and forensic medicine. Um, in Jazz Age New York. So what happened was is there were a lot of poisoning deaths that um, the coroner was seeing in uh, New York City, and they had to figure out why, how these people were dying and why they were dying, um, and they didn't have a way to do that. So they basically had to create or invent the whole field of forensic medicine. So it's coming of age of this entire field of science. Very, very good read. The Quester Journey is another really classic one. Um, two great examples are these two science documentaries, Particle Fever and Chasing Ice. And if you haven't watched, that, watched them, I highly recommend it. Particle Fever is the story of scientists who were involved with the discovery of the Higgs boson um, in, at the Large Hadron Collider. And Chasing Ice is the story of a, a nat National Geographic photographer, James Baylog, and his quest to um, capture the effects of climate change on Arctic glaciers. Both of them are very powerful stories. Um, and one of the reasons I think they're so powerful is that they tell the stories of the individual people. You watch them succeed, you watch their frustrations, you see them cry, you see them curse and scream, um, and then you see them triumphant as well. So it's both very, very powerful examples of storytelling. Some common challenges that scientists have brought up to me have been, um, number one, finding the characters. Um, some researchers don't forget that they themselves are a character. So don't forget to discount, to talk about yourself as well. Showing why someone would care. Um, at AGU, we have a lot of researchers who study the ocean. Some of them say, you know, I study ocean currents and I don't really see how that has any effect on people's lives. Why would anyone care? To that, my response usually is, if you're unsure about it, appeal to someone's sense of awe or grandeur. Um, for example, in the ocean, what oceanographers and what um, people who study the ocean bottom map the seafloor always say is, we know the surface of Mars better than we know our own oceans. So it's this huge, giant, great black hole that we're just trying to understand. 
Other challenges, setting the scene, which by that I mean providing the proper context for the story. A really great example of this is the film Hidden Figures. Um, and so I'm sure m most people in this audience are familiar with that story of the three um, African-American women who worked at NASA during the space race. The film is really powerful because it opens up with this scene of these three women driving to work at NASA. Um, they get a fl or their car breaks down and they're trying to fix it. So first off, you see that they're very able and capable. Their, their car breaks down and they're making an effort to figure out the problem and see if they can get it back on the road. Then they're approached um, by a white police officer. And so by this interaction, you see the racial tension of the time and the place. Then you, they say, oh, you know, like, actually, we work at NASA. We're just you know, on our way to work. So then you see the kind of excitement around the space race of the 1960s and this whole um, I, you know, national identity that came along with it. Like, kind of, we're all in this together. Has it end? The police officer escorts them to work that morning. So, and they're, they're triumphant. So I don't know if this interaction actually happened in real life, but that scene just kind of sets all those kind of pieces into place to provide the proper context of where we are, who these people are, and why we should care. Yeah, okay, okay, last one. Um, then the last thing I'll say is um, ending on a positive note. Um, at AGU, we publish a lot of research related to climate change. It's very doom and gloom. Um, but I would say make an effort to show how science can be part of a solution, that we have this opportunity here to safeguard our future, our health, our planet, things like that. Um, so I think I'm out of time, I'll end there. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks very much, Lauren. That was, that was very interesting. Um, and our last speaker today is another Lauren, Lauren Wolf, uh, the science desk editor for Chemical and Engineering News, published by the American Chemical Society. Lauren will share with us some of the lessons on science storytelling that she's learned in her career as a journalist. And this time, I will tee up the slides properly. All right. Uh, well, I think Lauren just basically told you everything that I could possibly tell you. She did a very, very good job. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you some examples um, from my own magazine of storytelling. Uh, so thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to share why I love storytelling today. Um, before I get into that, I'm going to tell a story about me, just to give you some context about some of the examples I'm going to show you and about my magazine. So I am a, a science journalist, but I started off as a scientist. I did my undergraduate chemistry degree at Lehigh University, um, and then I went to Boston University to get my PhD. You can see me there. So graduate student Lauren in 2004 giving her poster presentation on her thesis research. Um, I moved to do a postdoc at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's just north of the city here. Um, and then I was kind of like, eh, what do I want to do? <laughs> You'd think that, that I had had it all planned out, but I didn't. I realized that what I loved about science was telling people about it. And so I made, I sort of pivoted and I went into science journalism. I got a job at Chemical and Engineering News. Um, and so there are different weight pathways of becoming a journalist in science, but this was one that I took where I went at it from the science angle instead of the journalism angle. So I took this entry level position as a production editor that was putting the commas where they belong and helping the writers with the story, laying out the art. Um, and then eventually, when a position opened up, I, I was able to be a science reporter. I worked on the side for a while, writing stories and learning journalism. So you can see me there. That's, that's reporter Lauren. I was interviewing this scientist at the um, Space and Naval Warfare Systems Center in San Diego. Um, they do research on sea lions and dolphins. Um, they, they train them to identify mines in the water, um, but at the same time, they're monitoring their health and learning all kinds of new things about viruses in the water and things like that. And so I got to do really cool things like that as a reporter. Um, these days, as, as Stuart said, I'm the science desk editor at CNN, so I manage a group of about 13 reporters and editors, um, including our multimedia team. So you'll see some podcast and video examples then. And there's me as, as an editor. I was giving a talk at a recent American Chemical Society conference, and that's Avogadro the Mole. Um, and my husband. That's my husband, too. Don't forget about him. He's also in the photo. Um, okay, so about CNN, just briefly, again, to give you some context of the examples I'm going to show, we are a chemistry magazine. 
Um, we are distributed to about 150,000 members of the American Chemical Society. Uh, we've been published since 1923. We started off as this very technical journal type thing called Industrial and Engineering Chemistry and uh, became CNEN much later. Um, so nowadays we cover, we are a news magazine. We cover cutting edge science policy and business news. So it, I sort of always say it's like the news week for chemists in the US. Um, we, we write about breaking, breaking news of, um, you know, studies that are coming out. We talk about chemical regulations. We talk about pharma news, drug pricing, all, all anything that a professional chemist in, in the country and, and the world might want to know about what's going on in chemistry, we cover it. And uh, we, we put out weekly print issues. I think we're probably one of the only publications that still does that. We have weekly print issues and we are um, publishing news on our website daily. Okay, so that's where the, the examples I'm going to tell you about are coming from. Um, so let's talk about the power of storytelling. I think probably a lot of the things I'm going to say about why it's powerful are things you've already heard. I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so how many people have seen Hamilton? All right, very nice. I, I recently, this is me, I was at the Kennedy Center, um, very excited. I finally managed, was lucky enough to get some tickets. We, we tried for eight or nine hours, got the tickets. Um, but what I was struck by, uh, and when I was thinking about this talk, was the power of the storytelling that went into this, right? Lin-Manuel Miranda started with this tome. I think he used other literature as well, but this was a book that he started with and went from this really long book <laughs> to um, a rap musical about our founding fathers. And I think just the idea of translating something from this one form into this other that has reached so many people, kind of, it, it just shows you the power of storytelling. Um, now, there's, there's many different ways of telling stories. So my husband actually read this book and loved it. He, he was the audience for that book. He also liked the play. I did not read that book. It's not, not my jam. Historical nonfiction is not my jam, but the play was my jam, and it will stick with me. It will, I will remember the story of Alexander Hamilton because of that play. Um, so just thinking about different audiences, which is what a lot of people have already talked about today. So there's also this other audience. I'm sure that the writer of this book went from academic literature to write his book, and perhaps Lin-Manuel Miranda also used some of that academic literature. So there's an audience for that literature. There's an audience for that book and there's an audience for a play about a rap musical. Um, and so I think it, it's just looking at the creativity with which you tell the story and finding the right audience to tell the story to. Okay, and I'll give you, so that's about just general storytelling, but we're here to talk about communicating science. So this is a book that I did read. Um, Hope Yarin is a geochemist uh, who's now at the University of Oslo, and um, I loved this book. This. Uh, I probably would have read it anyway if it was a dry book, but she chose to tell her personal story, and that's another theme we were hearing about, is your scientists are human, they should tell their stories. And she chose to tell the story of how she got her science degree, how she became a professor, the struggles that she had with funding and being heard as a woman in this field, and how she did her first experiments. And in, in with that, she wove the story of trees I, I learned more about trees than I ever thought I would have learned or cared about, um, from seedling to timber. She talks about um, just the, the story of how the tree in her backyard came to be and how it survived all these years only to eventually get cut down later. And it, it, here's, I just picked a, a quote to give you an example of the power of the storytelling. Um, she's talking about the scientists found this, the oldest seed in existence. And um, so she says, after the scientists broke open the coat of a lotus seed and coddled the embryo into growth, they kept the empty husk. When they radiocarbon dated this discarded outer shell, they discovered that their seedling had been waiting for them within a peat bog in China for no less than 2,000 years. This tiny seed had stubbornly kept up the hope of its own future while entire human civilizations rose and fell. And then one day, this little plant's yearning finally burst forth within a laboratory. I wonder where it is right now. And so that reminded me of the, the Golden Gate Bridge analogy. I mean, these are the things when, when a scientist can, is able to put these things in that kind of perspective, it stays with you. I will always remember that. Um, okay, so now let's talk a little bit about science journalism. 
Um, so as I said, I work for CNN, and um, so telling stories about scientists, um, you know, is uh, is important. Not all scientists, like Hope Yarn, are able to write their own stories, and that's where journalists come in. Um, so journalists and, and press officers can help translate science stories to other platforms for these different audiences. And so um, the power of science journalism is, is, you know, there's all different benefits of telling your story as a scientist. One is when you can affect change in the community. And so I'm showing some examples here of some, some safety stories that we did. One, the one on the left here from 2009 and the one on the right from 2016. Basically, you know, our, the chemistry community cares a whole lot about chemical safety. For decades, people have been calling for better safety regulations and safety training in labs. And um, we did some in-depth reporting uh, in 2009. Sherry Sanji, I'm sure, sure some of you have heard of her, um, died during a, doing an experiment in UCLA because um, she wasn't trained properly and there was an accident, and we, we went back, we got hold of her lab notebooks, we looked at what happened, we interviewed scientists that she worked with, we interviewed um, safety officers at other universities and talked about better safety practices and what happened, lessons learned. Um, similarly, in 2016, unfortunately, a postdoc at the University of Hawaii in Manoa lost her arm, um, also doing an experiment where she was working with a high-pressure gas um, container and again, it was we, we talked with the people who went in and did the safety investigation. We looked at what happened um, and, and disseminated those safety practices to the community. And we heard later that, you know, this has an impact. Uh, for, in, for example, Dow Chemical, um, after the 2009 incident, started an outreach safety program with its university partners um, in the aftermath of that event. And... After the 2016 event, there was another company who had re reassessed its gas safety protocols. There was a lot of discussion in the community about how to handle these situations. And so that is one really good reason for communicating science to a science journalist. Um, I'll give you another example here. This is a little bit less high stakes. Um, but we launched a podcast earlier this year where we told the story of metal organic frameworks so let me tell you what those are. Um, metal organic frameworks, or MOFs, are um, these compounds. They've got uh, metal atoms in them, and they're fused together with these carbon linkers, and they form this porous solid network. People are really excited about them right now because they can store gases or they can clean the air by sucking in bad things, chemical weapon compounds, those kinds of things. And people are starting to build companies around them. They are starting to sew them into fabrics that could protect you or put them into gas masks, those kinds of things. And so we wanted to talk to some people about the excitement around this field. Um, one of the researchers, Matt Hardings, is shown here. He's the one that you're going to hear um, in this recording, along with my uh, reporter, Matt Davenport, who is interviewing him about his personal story of how he's 3D printing these moths into a solid. So let me see if I can get this going. So they're more stable than not stable, but that doesn't always mean stable. You know, moths, while they are a, a really interesting class of materials, many of them are not. That's as long as it goes. That's as long as it goes. Yeah, that's as long as it goes. Okay. <clears throat> so it doesn't, it's not working then? Okay. Oh, all right, I see. All right, well, that's okay. We'll just go to a different example. Let's uh, try this um, video. So what I was going to say about the podcast is that the power of, of telling that story, we heard from Matt Hardings afterwards, after we had put this um, podcast out, was that he heard from some scientists in the field who wanted to collaborate with him. They had heard him tell his story about how he worked out this, this problem of 3D printing these moths, and um, they contacted him and wanted to collaborate on, on various projects. And so I think one of the other po powerful parts of science journalism is that connection within the community. You have this audience, you, you, you are impacting the community, bringing people together, getting them to talk about certain things or work together to solve new scientific problems. And so this video that I'm going to show you, uh, hopefully this will, this will work, um, is another example where 
people have been talking about the reproducibility crisis. Everybody is worried about whether these studies that we're publishing actually can be reproduced. And uh, so one, one thing that people are trying, at least chemists in the community, are using GoPros and video cameras in their labs to actually record themselves doing their, their experiments and then publishing them with the stories. And they're using this as a way of helping with that reproducibility crisis. And what we wanted to show, we wanted to disseminate that information to the community. People are, not everybody knows about this. People are looking for better ways to do their experiments. And so I'll just show you the first minute of this. Hopefully it works. This is Matthias Bjornmal, and he's doing chemistry at about 50 meters per second. The tube he's clutching contains a sample of metal organic frameworks in the process of crystallizing. Bjorn Malm was part of a group of scientists investigating whether low gravity conditions would affect the size of the moth crystals, potentially giving researchers a new tool to control moth properties. They designed special injectors that allowed Bjorn Malm to mix two solutions just before jumping out of the plane. We're going to mix these two uh, solutions and it's going to form moth crystals. Aside from wanting to commemorate the experience, himself doing an experiment and then transition to showing people in the lab um, putting things together. Um, okay, so okay. So I'll just skip through this, but the idea was why why communicate science? Um, fame and glory, maybe, but probably not. Um, so to promote science, to find partners, which was the example that I showed in collaborating, to contribute to the scientific discourse and advances in the field, controlling your own message. I think a lot of scientists are worried that their words get distorted, and um, that is still a concern, but you have a better chance of controlling it if you do the talking yourself and not let someone else interpret your work. Um, educating the public and then dispelling bad science. There's lots of examples of, of bad bad science being reported in the press and you know you again controlling your message is, is useful. Okay, so what what do you need to know about sharing your science, knowing your audience? We've talked about this a lot. There are different audiences from the more technical audience all the way up to specialist media, general media, public media, um, and you know different different audiences have different um, things that they are looking for. So again, hearkening back to Hope Yaren's book, like that book was, was for me. I probably would have read it if it was more technical, but it still spoke to me um, because it was a story that I've gone through as well. Um, I will wrap up. But uh, <laughs> so I was going to just give a public service announcement about talking to reporters specifically and understanding the different terms that they use on the record, off the record, on background, what makes a good science story, and then being human when you are talking to, to um, a reporter or a public information officer. You have, we have these stories. This is a, a story of a postdoc who um, I interviewed him about this uh, way of imaging, a, like making a brain transparent and being able to study it. And he was talking about how he, had, how he had done the process. Like he melted and burned hundreds of mouse brains before he figured out the right conditions to make this thing work. And he told me that and I thought, wow, you know, you were the one that did the work. You were there, you were doing it. That is really interesting and that's something that you want to communicate in your science. Similarly, there was a story about nanoparticles being used for liposuction. And I was asking this rep uh, researcher like how she got the idea for this and she was talking about how she had just had a, had a baby and was, um, had been coming back from maternity leave and was going on vacation and was thinking, ah, I have to put on a bathing suit. What if, what if I could like melt this fat away really quickly and I didn't have to do all this exercise? Um, and so she had thought about that. All right, I'm done. <laughs> So, so we're running a bit late, and that's entirely my fault. Um, I, uh, I don't know if we have if we're going to get kicked out or not, but um, it, I, I would like to give the audience uh, a few minutes uh, if there's uh, any burning questions. I've got a few, but there we have one over there. Just wondering if um, you all have any tips for communicating to folks who might deny science entirely. <laughs> this is something that um, 
With Science and AAAS, we've been thinking of, in some ways, um, about just speaking within echo chambers. So how do we use these storytelling tactics to reach people who don't really like science to begin with? So does anybody? OK, Lauren. Um, uh, humanize it. Um, I people have a much bigger, greater chance of connecting with what you're saying if they connect with you. Um, so approach them first as a person and try to find some kind of shared values or shared experience and then once and get them to trust you basically and then people will be more receptive to your message. A good example of that is Catherine Hayhoe who's a climate scientist somewhere in Texas. Um, I'm, I feel terrible, I can't remember what institution, but she's a climate scientist, um, and she's also an evangelical Christian, and she does a lot of talks in the Christian community, and also in Texas, where that's very common, um, about climate change and things like that, and what she, and there's, if you just Google her and Google some of the talks she's given, she has good examples of that, where she talks about how much she loves Texas, and I think it's Texas A&M, and their football team, and all the, and the great barbecue they have in Texas, and then once she has kind of people hooked in and connected to her, then she talks about the climate message. So that's one, one way to do it. Any other questions? So I had a, I had a quick question kind of uh, going to the theme of this, of this session, which is this is a, an audience that's involved in scholarly communication and scholarly publishing in particular. And yesterday there was a, uh, I believe, a, a sort of a round table discussion, which the, the the title was, What is the Role of Publishers in Helping Researchers and Authors Communicate Beyond the Lab? And I was just sort of hoping to put that uh, question to the panel for this particular audience in particular. What is the sort of case for bringing some of these techniques into, into play in their work? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Yael, you have to start because you co-organized the session and you led the, uh, or you uh, moderated the roundtable yesterday. Which, and it was for exactly that reason that I thought I'd give somebody else a chance to speak a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it just comes back to the to the question of, of trying to communicate as much as possible, as broadly as possible, in as many different ways as possible. Um, it, it, I, it actually, I want to kind of dovetail that in with um, with Hannah's question. I think that there's a misconception oftentimes with people looking at scholarly communication that's, that it's elitist and there's um, uh, an impulse to kind of hold it at arm's length and if there are ways that we can break that down, humanize it more, make it more approachable, I think it will benefit everyone. I don't know if that answered your question, but I'm going to kick it off to Lauren or Lauren or Connell now. Okay, great. Anybody else want to weigh in there? You, you look like you're getting ready to say something. Yeah. <laughs> so, re repeat the question. I guess, I guess just the, okay, um, just, just it, since given, the, given this particular audience, mm -hmm. we've been talking a lot about science communication as storytelling. Are there ways that, uh, an, an, a, that, a, that a, an organization that's dealing with the publishing part of the value chain, for example, would benefit from putting these principles into, into practice? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I guess the motivation is kind of what I was talking about in the beginning, is that all of these stories that people eventually end up telling come from the primary literature, which is scholarly publishing, mm -hmm. right? And if you don't ever disseminate that going forward, you don't move down the chain to the more accessible, you know, to the more accessible platforms for publishing. Um, and I think you know the the public information officers are, are key in that in that role like that that information doesn't get to reporters it, it's again a chain of information that goes from from the journal up through to the to the reporters um, if if the scientist hasn't decided that in the middle they're going to tell their own story not everyone can do that not everyone is is hope yarn so i would just add that i mean i don't know if i I won't say whether publishers have a responsibility um, or not to help communicate outside of the um, publishing world, but um, there are definitely opportunities to do that, and I think it is it would benefit um, a lot of people. It would be very beneficial for the publisher. Um, our AGU at our publisher is Wiley, and they've started piloting a project where they um, create like kind of one to two minute short videos about certain chosen articles or certain pieces of research. Um, so that's one way that publishers can get involved, um, but... I don't know. Okay. I'd say go for it if you if you're interested in it. Yeah. Connell, have you ever had uh, 
points where you have wished you had more sort of support in telling stories and, and, and what sort of form that might take? Well, certainly in terms of publication, we, I rely very much on the, uh, our institution's publicity officer and the same mm -hmm. with our collaborators. I would be very uncomfortable if journals were, uh, individual journals were actually uh, writing um, publicity notes. Uh, I think there's potential conflict of interest there. Mm. Um, but certainly, you know, science and nature, for instance, although I'm not sure they specifically sent, put out press releases, um, they, uh, they very much write and choose the articles that they think are going to make a splash, uh, and then just the kudos of having a nature or science paper automatically puts um, a, a press release high on the list of things that journalists are going from mm -hmm. other sort of magazines uh, and newspapers are going to look at first. Mm -hmm. And I'd also say that I, um, you know, I encourage all of my reporters to form relationships with editors at the various journals that are in their in their beats, their specialties. And so, especially at the American Chemical Society where we work, we have a much closer relationship with the journal editors. And mm -hmm. so, those editors, we have a relationship with them, and hopefully, they will be sending us the flagging the really important papers that they have coming out and telling us about things, trends in the field that they think we should be covering. So there is that relationship of, of giving information that way too. Does anyone in the audience have, uh, have anything they'd like to add? All right, I guess we will wrap it up here then because we're a bit late. Thanks very much. <laughs>